Ashley, thank you for coming. Professor Ashley Grossman of the Barts and the London School of Medicine, and you're here with me in the Asia at the European Neuroendocrine Association Congress. Uh, welcome to eCancer TV. It's good thank to have you. Thank you very program. much. Are you enjoying the, the meeting, by the way? Very much. I've only been here for a short while so far, but the two uh, symposia I've been to have been outstanding. It's been mm. great fun. I want to ask you about aggressive pituitary tumours because we've heard all sorts of things about Cushing's disease, about possible yeah. medical therapies, about the way things are going right and the way things are going wrong. But your particular interest is in aggressive tumours. But what do you define as an aggressive tumour? Well, that's an interesting point. I think we need to first of all state that most pituitary tumours are relatively easy to treat, both Cushing's disease, prolactinomas, acromegaly, even non-functioning tumours. But there is a small percentage which are very, can be very unpleasant. And the strange thing about them is that it's very hard to predict when they're going to go nasty. And by going nasty, I mean they are invasive, they recur, they are difficult to treat, and whatever you do, they just tend to keep coming back. Of course, surgery can give you a cure in many cases, can't it? In the great majority of cases for pituitary tumours, surgery is actually curative. Uh, in a number of cases, we need to follow it with radiotherapy, particularly if we think there's residual tumour. But the, certainly the combination of surgery and radiotherapy for the majority is curative, and the tumour won't come back. And although you follow the patient up, maybe lifelong, you can give them a pretty good um, outlook. Uh, you do have an incidence of recurrence, though, don't you, with some tumours? There is, even with radiotherapy. If you don't give radiotherapy, say to the typical non-functioning tumour, you've probably got a 50% chance of recurrence at 10 years or more. So you either then repeat surgery or then give radiation treatment. If you use radiotherapy in a standard modern way, probably the recurrence rate is only 3, 4, 5% maximum. Now, how does the busy doctor know if he or she is dealing with an aggressive pituitary tumour? Uh, in general, I think the answer to your question is you can't tell. Uh, the first time round, sometimes they look large, they look as though they're infiltrating the temporal lobe, but very often they don't. Um, then you'd say, well, let's ask the pathologist, can they tell us? And again, the majority of cases they won't. Sometimes if they start seeing mitoses, they can look for the key 67, which is the proliferation index, uh, or P53, which may be positive staining. They're called atypical adenomas, and then you've got to look at those very carefully. But most of the time, you look at the tumour, it looks bland, the key 67 is low, you really don't know if it's going to come back or not. So when do you find out? And you find out because you follow the patient up. And that's really the, I think, absolutely key point. If you're, particularly if you don't give radiotherapy the first time round, you really have to keep a close eye on these patients, repeat the MRI at one, two, three yearly intervals, and just watch them. And you may be lucky. Half of those respond to surgery, never comes back, but a goodly number do. Um, our uh, treatment plan is very much based on looking at the scan after they've had their first operation, maybe six, seven months later. If it looks as though there's a residual tumour at that stage, then we'll go into radiotherapy then. If not, we'll just monitor carefully. Now, when things do get sticky, what sorts of things do you start to do? So, if you've then got a patient with a recurrent tumour, the first thing is to consider the standard radiotherapy, particularly if you can't quite see exactly where the tumour is or was. Occasionally, you can actually see a focus, and you actually see where the tumour is, and in which case you can use radiosurgery, which is it's easier because it's a single session. Focus, sharp, you can deal it there and then. Or if it's come back and they've had standard radiotherapy, you can add it on, so-called salvage radiotherapy. So you get standard radiotherapy, then radiosurgery. So you've got two modalities, and the great majority of tumours will respond to that one way or another. Problem is, is when you've done that and you've still got tumour which is coming back, what do you do then? Now, these aggressive tumours, if you like, are, as I said, the minority. Carcinomas need to be defined as those which clearly show metastases, either inside or outside the brain. They're even rarer. But as far as a patient's concerned, an aggressive tumour or carcinoma, either way, they've got a very unpleasant tumour that is going to cause them problems. You do, however, have some medicines that you're trying out. Uh, there's a standard theme chemotherapy. There are some more interesting and unusual That's agents. right. I, I think in the first instance, you might try standard biologicals. You might push harder with uh, dopamine agonists like cabergoline, somatostatin analogs, octreotide, maybe the newer ones like pasiriotide. 
But if they don't work, then you really are in deep territory. Now, standard chemotherapy can occasionally work, but in general, the outcomes are pretty disappointing. And one of the things we reviewed a few years ago was the use of standard chemotherapy, and frankly, it was it, not terribly good. But temozolomide is being talked about. A few years back, Tony Heaney, almost by serendipity, found that temozolomide, which is an alkylating agent and, and is transformed to decarbazine in vivo, seemed to be particularly effective. And that was really a very exciting time. It was the first time these really nasty tumours seemed to respond. So a number of studies then follow, case histories, one, two, three, four, often very impressive. And then the idea suddenly came up, well, temozolomide is a drug that's been used for gliomas. And in gliomas, it particularly works if an enzyme which inactivates the effect, MGMT, is absent. So the bright idea came, Anne McCormack in Australia, Kalmakovex in Canada, well, maybe if MGMT is not there, patients will respond more effectively. And Anne and I looked, for example, at a couple of patients. One of my patients, acromegaly, MGMT staining was very positive, didn't respond to temozolomide, and unfortunately died. Second patient, no MGMT staining, amazing response to temozolomide. And several other case studies followed that. So you have small numbers so far, but it's beginning to look as if you can discriminate which patients may be sensitive to temozolomide. Well, we thought so. We thought that this was a, a superb way of customising therapy. Two further studies currently in press, one from the States and one from France, a bit less sanguine, but there are problems. I mean, what type of antibody do you use? How do you define positive and negative immunostaining? So I think it's, um, the jury is still out. It does look interesting, and there are certainly and quite a number of patients who responded very dramatically. So you've got a really nasty tumour. You don't have any other options like surgery or radiotherapy. I think, I think without a doubt, temozolomide is a possibility. MGMT staining may be useful. And the MGMT status of your patient is just one indicator. There are some other possible predictive indicators, aren't there? I, I think at present, uh, knowing whether or not the patient's going to respond, it, I think remains difficult. I would not say at this stage that anything should prevent you trying temozolomide. It's a relatively easy tolerated drug, major side effects in practice, fatigue, you've got to watch the bone marrow. But really, it's an easy drug. It's used five days a month for the most common regime. It's something which, um, other than its cost, which is still fairly high, although it's out of patent, uh, really ought to be considered. Uh, you've also been looking at a different category of agents, the mTOR inhibitors. Tell me about that. OK. Uh, some years ago, we looked at the molecular pathogenesis, and we've got an ongoing study in, in that area. And we found that AKT and mTOR were generally overexpressed. So this particular pathway, the PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, is overactive in the majority of pituitary tumours. So we now have drugs, the rapamycin analogues, or rapalogs, which specifically target mTOR. And we know that drugs like Everolimus, or Rare001, is beginning in huge double-blind trials showing a effectiveness for uh, new endocrine tumours generally. So in theory, if somebody has a pituitary tumour which is progressing and it's been resistant to all other known modalities, a drug like Everolimus might be worth considering. And we live in the era of molecular medicine, so you've got the EGFR receptors also come up as a possible candidate for targeting. That's very right. There have been a number of studies looking at the EGFR receptors on um, pituitary tumours generally, but more recent data from Los Angeles and Melmed's group has suggested that particularly with prolactinomas, the in vitro data show that drugs which block the EGFR, like gefitinib, and maybe even the antibodies, could slow down tumour growth. So again, it's a possibility, something to be tried when all other therapeutic modalities have failed. It is clearly an extremely exciting field, but that doesn't make it practically useful yet. Could you give me the words of wisdom about what <laughs> busy doctors can get out of your research so far? I'm not sure how much wisdom I can <laughs> impart to you today, but I think you're absolutely correct that as we're beginning to understand the molecular pathogenesis more, and we have the tumour available for in vitro or ex vivo studies, I think within the next five or ten years we're going to be able to customise 
individual treatments for the individual patient. In other words, we will find a particular molecular signature which will suggest you should be tried on everolimus or temozolamide or gefitinib or other therapies like, for example, interfering with the beta-catenin pathway. And I think it's very exciting that for the first time, not only we've got a whole array of different therapies, but we can individualize them for the specific patient. And could you give me some sort of seat of the pants idea of how much of an improvement this might bring in these aggressive tumors? You, you haven't got a lot of them to deal with, have you? I, no, I think, well, first of all, it's, it's true I, that um, multi-centered um, collaborations have to be the way forward. The single person looking at the old tumor once every two years on their own in isolation, really that we should all be collaborating much more closely and doing things properly. Uh, but I think for the individual patients, maybe any improvements at the moment are probably going to be fairly short-lived, maybe a year or two years. I think there's beginning to see some data of escape, for example, from temozolamide. But if we have these collaborative studies, then maybe using two or three drugs at the same time may be better. And I think there's going to be the incremental improvement. Just like you know, 20 years ago there was in childhood leukemias, we started off by using single agents, slightly improved survival. Now with uh, double or triple or quadruple chemotherapy, we know the majority of childhood leukemias are curable. And I don't think it's too much to suggest that in 10, 15 years we'll be in the same situation with new endocrine tumors generally and pituitary tumors specifically. And the way to, to do this is to meticulously co collect the data. I think we have to work together so that we, it's going to happen, but rather than being in 50 years, it'll happen in five years. So in a few words, how would you describe what doctors should distill from the hopes and the progress so far in uh, aggressive pituitary tumours? I, th I think the bottom line, as I see it at the moment, is that seeing an aggressive or even carcinomatous pituitary tumour, one should not give up. That as treating other neuroendocrine tumours, there are a lot of arrays of treatments which are being introduced, and that if the individual physician or oncologist or endocrinologist feel slightly isolated, not too sure, they should look to collaboration, look to discuss with other people, and that way get the best possible treatment for their individual patient. Ashley, thank you for joining us here on eCancer TV, and um, I wish you a happy journey back to a uh, wonderful medical establishment, Bart's, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been my pleasure. Thanks a lot.